All right, what's up team? Hey, week five, I'm coming to you <laughs> uh, on location. I know it's a crappy background, but it, we're talking supplements today, so I wanted to jump into my kitchen where I have all my stuff, and uh, it's obviously an unfinished, uh, in, in process of being remodeled kitchen, so bear with me today. So hope you guys are doing well. Seen a couple, a little bit of traffic going on with some questions. Uh, hopefully they're getting picked up and addressed pretty well. It looks like they are. So today's focus is twofold. Uh, we're gonna keep reviewing the outline and talking about how we're going to create a strategy post challenge, which is the ultimate goal of all of this, right? Good results during the challenge, a good plan afterwards. So I would like to see some people post it, uh, share it. What do you, what, what are your, how are you going to lay out your day? What are some things you're gonna do when you know you wanna cheat? How are you gonna continue your weight loss? What would be your goals? Maybe after the challenge, you still have 50 pounds to lose or 10 pounds to lose. Well, what's a reasonable number? Could I lose a pound a month? If I have 10 pounds left, could I lose a pound a month for the next 10 months while keeping my lifestyle on something that's very tolerable and something that's enjoyable? That's the goal, that's what we wanna create. And so while you're creating this outline, I want to introduce, this is where I introduce the concept of aim small, miss small, or you can even call it diminishing returns, right? There becomes a point where we can only do something so well that it then can become a, a, a hindrance. What I mean by that is this. Let's say I go very strict paleo for an extended period of time and I'm building up over and over all these cravings and all these things that I wanna eat and then eventually I crash, right? I go, I go bad and I go bad badly. I go into two or three days of binge eating on stuff that I shouldn't be eating, right? So by aiming small and missing small, here's what I mean. When you start to feel like you're getting into that place, and this is post-challenge, again, the challenge is supposed to be 100%, and that's the goal of the challenge. <clears throat> but after the challenge, when you feel yourself getting in that regards, what can you do? What small cheat can help stave off the big cheats, all right? So as an example, uh, I make sure, I try to get as much vegetables as I can every day. Cutting up a salad and making my own salad dressing can be sometimes frustrating. Um, it doesn't always taste the best with your own salad dressing. So I'll buy these bags of salads from Kroger and they have their own uh, uh, dressings within them. Now, yes, they probably have some sugar. I know they have some sugar in it and there's probably processed oils in there. Now, that's a sm aiming small, it's missing small really. So if I throw that little bit of dressing into a huge bowl of vegetables and that helps get me through that and that doesn't build up this resistance to wanting to cheat in a big way, then it's a win, right? If I take a small step to, uh, off my track to avoid taking a big step down the road, so keep that in mind as you're putting your plan together, all right? When people are, when you're worried about, should I have cheese? I, you know, another one that came up the other day was somebody wanted a, a cheeseburger. Well, they went and got a burger, but got, you know, wrapped in lettuce, but they removed the cheese, but the cheese is what they really wanted. Well, I'd rather you go ahead and have that piece of cheese than continually starve off yourself and then end up going to having like five cheeseburgers the following week, okay? So it's just the concept of aiming small, missing small, and um, taking small steps to the side in order to avoid big steps off the edge. Cool? Keep that in mind, put that into your, your plan. All right, so now supplements is a huge topic and I'm only gonna cover what I take. I'm not saying it's absolutely right, there's other options, um, but this works for me and this is what it's always been about, find your own stride, find your own uh, um, opportunity to make this work, okay? So here are my key supplements and we'll go through them one by one. Now let's start with the basics, right? Vitamin D. So I get mine, mine looks like this because it's a prescription, but you can get it anywhere, okay? You can get it on Amazon. Um, there's tons of good opportunities to get vitamin D. So vitamin D is synthesized in the body and it can only happen when our skin comes in contact with sunlight. And in the Midwest winters, especially today, as you all already know, there's zero sunlight. It's gray, it's cold. It even looks like it's starting to snow, all right? So you're never gonna get sunlight on your skin or very rarely would you ever get that. So. Vitamin D plays a huge role in managing systemic inflammation and immune function, all right? It's something we absolutely need and we don't get enough of. I bet everybody right now in the Northeast Indiana and probably the Midwest is vitamin D deficient if you were to measure it, all right? So vitamin D, love it. Then uh, probiotic. So I like Garden of Life. I've just had those for a while. There's other good options as well. Um, but and if you read the labels, you're gonna find probably 12 different types of good bacteria in the back. I'm not gonna go through all those, it's largely irrelevant. But it goes back to the same concept that, you know, 20,000 years ago, we would have had access to only water that we would, we would only be drinking water. And within that water source is preferably would be good bacteria, right? Now, obviously there may not have been situations where that's the case, but we would have good bacteria that would be consumed on a regular basis. So our gut is lined with really good bacteria. That's essential to our immune function and to breaking down the foods we eat. 
giving the proliferation of antibiotics and really crappy processed foods and oils, most people see a, a significant detriment to their good gut bacteria, okay? So adding in these probiotics is a great way um, to refill that gut bacteria. And then there's also good opportunities with food. Um, now again, it's not challenge friendly, but if, if dairy agrees with you and that's something you feel like you wanna build back in over time, uh, kefir and raw, raw kefir and stuff like that is proven to have the same kind of good gut bacteria. That is if, good, if dairy works for you. Um, this works for me just well. So probiotic. Uh, fish oil, right? Everybody's heard of this, right? So your fish oil is your omega-3 fatty acid, your DPA is an EPA, uh, um, omega-3 fatty acids. So why is this important? Now, it is theorized that 10,000 years ago, and we're talking paleo era, we would have had a ratio of around one to two in terms of omega-3s to omega-6 fatty acid ratios in our body. So for every one unit of omega-3s, I had two omega-6s, okay? What has happened over the years is that our consumption of grain and processed foods and our consumption of meat that eats grain significantly boost our omega-6 levels in our bodies, right? So we talked about it's not just what you eat, it's what you eat eats, right? So cattle are designed or they're built to eat uh, grass. So we have a situation now where they're bulked up with grain that increases the omega-6s in their bodies. We eat that meat, increases our omega-6. So if you're 100% grass-fed meats, your need for omega-3 uh, fish oil supplementation probably drops down pretty significantly. Um, but if you're not always getting it, it's a good thing to look at and a good thing to add in. So why does having an imbalance of omega-3s to omega-6s matter? Heart disease, insulin sensitivity, and systemic inflammation. And if you just Google systemic inflammation, you'll find a litany of things that are caused by um, long-term chronic systemic inflammation, okay? So it's just a great thing to add, um, unless you're allergic to fish, there's really no other reason why it, it shouldn't work for you, okay? Uh, the other two, so this one is less of a supplement, more of a food product, right? So this is relatively new to me, something I've built in. Um, uh, there's a ton of research on it too, if you just Google it. But one thing, the first thing that I got into it was appetite suppression. Uh, when I was extending my fasting periods, I would look for something to help kill the cra hunger cravings, and this works like a charm. Uh, I posted this a while back, a couple weeks ago, when somebody was looking for help with their hunger cravings. Apple cider vinegar mixed with some water, just it, it knocked it out of the park for me. It's also an alkaline product, so we talk about pH balance in the body, alkalinity versus acidity. Um, most of us, if we eat a lot of meat, or um, if we have been eating a lot of processed crap over the years, we can have a higher uh, acidic um, uh, balance in our body, and this helps balance that out, okay? Uh, there's a lot of other stuff on blood pressure and heart disease. Uh, the hard research on it is, um, is, is more limited than I think a lot of the anecdotal stuff. But again, first and foremost, from an appetite suppressant, it works wonders for me. And then I think, it, I think some of the research on it is, is pretty promising what it can do uh, in the long run as well. So there's that. And then we have something that might be new to most of you. Um, this is called an exogenous ketone. So beta hydroxybutyrate is the name of the, the actual molecule. So a ketone is what our body makes when it breaks down fat. So our body breaks down our fat storage, turns it into fuel, and these ketone bodies form. Now ketones are just as efficient in using our body for fuel, if, if not way better than glucose. So what we want to do, and what I love this for is a couple different things. A, it's an appetite suppressant as well. B, it puts our body, it, it kind of hacks the ketosis process. So if you've ever heard of somebody trying to get into ketosis, what they'll probably do is eat less than 30 or 40 grams of carbohydrates a day, eat nothing else but proteins and fats, and take in no other sugar. So what that does is it, it, it takes fasting and kind of amplifies it. And so it says, teaches your body, there's no glucose, so I have to go to my fat storages to burn out all this fat. Uh, and then these ketone bodies are produced and you have it's great for mental clarity, it's great for energy, it's great for an appetite suppressant, um, and it's even shown that it can improve physical performance. So, three capfuls of this is what I do every day as well. There, that. Uh, and I'm actually really enjoying it as well. Okay, I think it, it helps boost weight loss too because it puts your body in fast forwards in that ketotic state. So you can jump up instead of waiting 18 hours to get ketotic or 24 hours, you can get there in about two. All right, so it's a good, nice little hack. So the way I structure this is three spoonfuls of this, I just do a swig of this, put them into here, fill this up with water, these two pills, a swig of this, and that's every morning. And if I drink this stuff combined with this, this is like a quarter gallon of water, um, I'm not hungry till I'm even pushing my fasting back to a one o'clock most days. So 
Some things to look at, you can also look at protein and creatine. I think those are great for post-workout, especially as you get more active and more involved in your physical endeavors. Um, but these are the five that I key in on and that I, work, I use quite often. So I know that was a little longer than I wanted to go, but let me know if you have any questions on that stuff. Again, really look at the exogenous ketones, I think, and the apple cider vinegar from an appetite suppressant and everything else from a total health perspective can work very, very well. Uh, let me see some of those outlines. We'll see you next week. And then weigh-ins are next Saturday, February 25th at noon. See you then.